I'm a in Southwark in South London, where amongst other things, I lead on equalities. And I'm also a global campaigner on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which have women's rights at its heart. And I'm also an executive committee member of the Labour Foreign Policy Group. And we're really delighted to co-host this meeting tonight with the Labour Women's Connect. Um, if you're not on mute, um, please do go, go on mute for the moment. Uh, um, before we uh, kick off, I'm just gonna read the safeguarding statement for this event from the Labour Women's Network. Uh, we expect all Labour Women's Network events to be conducted in an atmosphere of sisterly respect. Abusive or inappropriate behaviour will not be tolerated and participants may be removed. If our safe space is significantly compromised, we may feel the need to shut down the meeting at short notice. Um, so as I said, other housekeeping rules do please stay on mute unless you're speaking in the Q&A or you're a speaker. Um, feel free to tweet. This meeting is being recorded and we'll post it on social um, uh, on the YouTube channel afterwards. So if you don't want to be on video, keep your video off. So why are we all here? Well, firstly, we all care about tackling male violence against women and girls. And secondly, November marked the start of 16 days of activism against gender based violence. But we all know it's not a fight for 16 days, it's a fight every single day because too many women still can't live in safety. A recent report from UN Women uh, showed that one in two women either experienced or know someone who experienced violence since COVID. But we are here to focus on solutions and they are often driven by women. And I'm really excited about our brilliant panel who I will introduce in a minute. So we wanna focus on solutions about what's working around the world and what we can all do together. So before we kick off with the panel, I'm gonna hand over to Ashley Dalton, Labour Women's Network Executive Committee member to say a few words. Thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, I'm Ashley Dalton and I'm a management committee member, uh, executive committee member for Labour Women's Network. And just wanted to say that Labour Women's Network is absolutely delighted to be partnering with Labour Foreign Policy Group this evening. And our particular thanks go to Alice um, and her team for the work that they've put into to making this uh, a success. We're thrilled to welcome such an incredible panel of expert women from right across the globe tonight. You're in for a real treat. Um, Labour Women's Network believes that women can't have equal power until we are free from harassment, abuse and assault and that we will not be free from male violence until we have equal power. So we have therefore incorporated women's safety as one of our core objectives alongside women's representation, power and agency. And we're really proud to have done that. We're proud also to have improved Labour's complaints process for sexual harassment complaints. We've secured a named staff lead for ensuring women's safety at Labour Party conference. We've encouraged Labour's front bench to develop structural solutions and use the language of ending male violence. We've worked with Labour Two and Fabian Women and the Centenary Action Group and many others to become a louder, prouder and evidence-based voice against male violence. We've also been working to amplify the work of our sisters in the Party of European Socialists. But we're not going to stop and we won't stop fighting until we get the fully independent complaints process that women deserve, that we end male violence and that ending male violence becomes a political imperative and it's a priority for the Labour Party and beyond. And that the nonsense of women blaming measures like don't wear headphones or hail a bus or don't stay out late are a thing of the past. And what we would say is please do join Labour Women's Network. Be proud to be part of the fight. Um, and we look forward to working with you all and hearing to everything that everyone's got to contribute this evening. Thanks, Alice. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to move to our panel. I think we're going to be spotlighted in a minute on screen, so I will introduce them. Uh, first off, I'm pleased to introduce Shakria Barakze, uh, former Afghan Member of Parliament and former Ambassador to Norway and an amazing uh, women's rights activist. And I was reading her story before this and it's really amazing, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. We've got Preet Gill, MP, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for International Development, who's really been leading on the fore on violence against women and girls uh, globally, as well as doing a lot at home. We've got Shafer Okore, who's the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Women Political Leaders Organization. Shafer will have to leave a little bit early because she's in Nairobi and it's a little bit later there than it is here. 
Um, and we've got Deba Syed, who is a lawyer and women's rights activist. Um, so it's an amazing panel. Um, if people could go on mute, that would be great. So I'm going to kick off with the same question to each of you, and you've got up, up to three minutes to answer. I'm going to go to you first, uh, Schaefer. So quite simply, reflecting on your own experiences, what have you seen around the world that's really work, working when it comes to tackling male violence? Thank you so much, Alice, and it's so lovely to be here and to talk about this very critical issue. Um, and one, the first thing I just wanted to say is, is thank you to the Labour Women's Party for claiming the word ending male violence, because I think there's lots of ways in which we are still talking about violence against women in such, in such a, we are making it nuanced, we are making it sound palatable, we are making it sound like it, we cannot call it for what it is, and it's truly just men are being violent towards women because they don't respect women and they don't believe women have autonomy, agency, or that their lives matter. So thank you for claiming this title. I think it's very necessary. Um, as regards your question in terms of what I have seen that is working, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm happy to be seeing now and I want to see more of because it's not enough is actual tangible accountability for male violence. And when I talk about tangible accountability, what I mean is when men lose power, when men lose their significance, when men lose um, their positions, uh, when there are actual consequences legally for them to be able to pay for the violence that they met upon women and girls around the world. I think that is one thing that I'm really happy about. And I'll give an example. Um, a couple of months ago, a radio station, um, we had two local presenters who were talking about women. Um, so there was this woman who had gone to visit her, what, what um, she is known to have been her partner. And, and when she got to this man's house and, and um, you know, the, the, the innuendo that of this man, she wasn't pleased about them and she refused to continue with the conversation or whatever it is that this man wanted to go on. When she refused, this man literally pushed her from the floor of the building. I think it was five stories, right? And this woman was in the hospital and everybody kept saying how, oh my God, didn't she know what she was getting into? Um, what did she expect going into this man's house? And then women and feminist women and young women and older women, and you would see that Sorry. the institution around um, um, this kind of conversation, and it was being had on radio and, and the presenters were making fun of her um, and that there were actions taken against them, right? And what this did is to be able to not just claim the agency of women and not just claim that women's security or women's lack of security is a paramount need in society and within institutions. So holding men accountable is one of the things that I'm seeing starting to happen. It's not happening enough because we still have a lot more women who are not safe in, within homes, within workspaces, while walking in, bar, in bus packs, in trains, whichever space women exist in, they're not safe. So I wanted to see more accountability and accountability that is not postponed or that has to wait, I think is one of the things that's really making me very happy about ending male violence. Thanks so much, uh, Schaefer. Really great start. I'm going to go to Preet now to make some opening remarks, um, either on that question or, or just to kick us off. Yeah, just to say, I was looking at some uh, analysis around what actually does work. And in 2013, um, there was analysis done on policies on violence against women in 70 countries. So it looked at quite a lengthy period from 1975 to 2005. And what I actually revealed was that the most important and consistent factor driving policy change was feminist activism. So that played more of an important role than left wing parties, more than numbers of women legislators or even national wealth. Um, and it just shows that strong, vibrant domestic feminist movements use international and regional conventions and agreements as levers to influence policy making. I suppose the question I ask myself is that, you know, how long are we actually going to put up with this? And I, I think we saw the largest um, social movement uh, recently, the farmers protest, and we saw women like Rihanna and Greta Thunberg really speak, speak out uh, against why this, you know, uh, rights-based uh, protest was important. And actually what that protest has shown that in a year, the, the, these farmers have managed to affect change and now the government has repealed laws. So there's something about actually what more that we could do. And I, I, I've seen some really, really good examples. I mean, the first thing I would say, speaking to Global South activists, especially um, 
is that we have got to have a system where we fund women's right activists and organizations absolutely direct because they are the ones at the fore, they are the ones on the ground, they understand the complexities and they are the ones that are dealing with it. And far too often what we do is we give the money to organizations funneling it in from top down and actually it needs to be bottom up approach. But there's been some really good examples across the world, Raising Voices in Uganda, for example, they set up a domestic violence watch group made up of community members who actively actually watched for violence and intervened when appropriate. Um, they documented cases of abuse. They offer assistance to women experiencing violence. So do things like referrals, uh, referring on to other services. Um, and, you know, and they do intervene when violence was happening in homes. And far, often, far too often as well, they were bringing in local leaders where necessary so watch groups included women and men who received specialized ongoing training in conflict resolution. And actually, this was a really good program in Uganda and in India. I think we all saw some years ago the very high profile case of the gang rape of the woman on a bus in Delhi who was with her boyfriend, actually, uh, and she was murdered and tortured. But it, it spurred, actually, Davy to form the Progressive Women's Forum. And actually what that did in India, it really thrust domestic violence, which was seen very much as a private affair, into the public sphere. And, um, you know, women in different states were calling for a ban of alcohol in the region, and they actually won because it was very linked to domestic abuse uh, and abuse. But of course, there is still much more to do. I'm, I'm just thinking about culture norms. How do we educate our boys? Why do we think it's OK uh, for the kind of attitudes, um, you know, that continue? And I suppose, you know, being a children's services manager, the one thing that you do see is so many women uh, have put up with the verbal abuse that they suffer, of coercive control, of being put down. This just becomes very quite normalised. But of course, this then becomes a pattern of behaviour that then leads to escalations uh, of other norms. And I think it's really understanding about our collective responsibility that we have uh, to speak out and amplify those voices, because in many countries, they, they, you know, women face human rights violations, they are silenced, they are suppressed, uh, they will face uh, very different circumstances to many of us sitting in the West. So let's use our positions to amplify those voices. Let's um, really have concerted social movements that we support around the world because really enough is enough. Thanks, Alice. Thanks so much, Preet. Some really tangible examples. I'm going to go now to uh, Shakria. And if people are seeing everyone, if you just use view speaker, you'll just see the person speaking. So Shakria, over, over to you. From my point of view, um, well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's very heartbroken for me that today I'm talking about the male violence against women where half the population of Afghanistan just because of this violence has been surrounded by violence. They are not allowed for work or for education. This is very clear. It comes from the map. I was under name of religion or culture or whatever. But this is very important. How much female are taking that uh, or tolerating this situation? I, I have to be I agree with the previous speaker that they, when, when women are raising their voice, those voices need to be, get international recognition. The struggles which is today women are fighting for their own basic rights, rights for education, for work, this needs to be uh, supported. I think we are living in a world which is injustice is very clear. We are living in a world which is it's male dominated world and they are leading every life our life they are controlling but that's important how we should accept them to be just a piece of remote control on their hands or we will stand for our own rights and i think cultural behavior is very important the misinterpretation of religion is very important the collective effort to support women despite of where they are, what is their religion, what's their geography. This is important. The solidarity of women what can be a tool of success for the future. Plus, and besides, government policies are also important. Also, we need to make the UN women to be a very accountable, tangible uh, body within the United Nations. It, despite of all the progress was been made, I think that is the time that United Nations themselves needs to correct and fix their problem with the women on the globe. But today we are talking about um, ending violence and particularly male violence against women in the globe where more than half of population in this world in this globe are suffering from 
different type of violence, physical, domestic, political, and uh, system, I would say gender, I, some of the countries is going on. I think this is for us, time for us to our mouth shut. This is time for us to be more aware about these rights for more activity, more advocacy, and more asking for justice. If we keep silence, things will make change from bad to worse. This time we need unity. We need to be united. We need to strategize our effort for a brighter future to put in that domestic violence and particularly the male violence against women. Thank you very much. And I'm going to come back to Afghanistan and the UN a, a bit later as well. Uh, Deba, over to you to, to kick us off with your thoughts. Um, yes, no, thank you so much, Alice, for the invitation. And it's an honor to be on a panel with such esteemed women. Um, I just want to build on what Preet said, because it's the most important, important point. I like to see myself as a uh, an activist and my work began in feminist activism from the Me Too movement and it was really a hashtag that triggered an entire global movement and I think if we ever if we want to see systemic change we have to do more work to build on these movements and um, build on successful movements like the Me Too movement, which created such a ripple effect across the world and really translated into legislative reform and into policy reform, but shifted the power momentarily or for a minute, shifted the power away from power, you know, entrenched power in structures to um, to women being having access to the internet and being able to share that story, to share their individual stories. And I think that's been really, really fascinating in my work because I work with women who've been sexually harassed in the workplace, but they are really losing faith in the traditional justice system, in um, reporting mechanisms. They don't get the results that they want, but we're seeing this like really interesting building of digital activism and organizing online, which I think, um, has much more significance in um, the global south, for example. You've seen um, women who have never had a voice before be able to take to social media and trigger change. So for example, last year, there was um, a famous case of a, a mother, she was a mother living in Lahore in Pakistan, and she stopped on the side of the road. She was with her three kids and she went to refuel um, her car and during that incident she was robbed and gang raped in front of her children and um, afterwards the reaction from the police was to victim blame her they said you know why was she stopping on the side of the road why wasn't she out with a male a uh, you know companion um, and there was an absolute explosion on social media horrified at this event and there was this hashtag going around saying it was called motor motorway incident and they were calling for the the removal of this police chief um, and it was um, they really managed to build momentum and get um, you know apply pressure in a way that just wasn't possible before social media and I think that is particularly important in a country like Pakistan which is obviously very conservative um, and there is huge barriers in terms of being able to um, voice those stories um, because having possibly anon anonymity around uh, behind social media can uh, overcome that barrier. Um, and it's, I, I believe that platforming these survivors and centering these stories is really key to breaking down the reasons why so, um, male violence and um, violence against women is so prevalent. But I just, that's one point, but there's another point I just wanna raise on more broadly that um, we need to look at the reasons why women are targets of violence in the first place. And that is, you know, very simply that we are we are less equal to men. So we are less able to fight back, you know, um, just legally and um, in terms of justice provisions. Um, we are weaker in that sense because we have less rights. It is it is a fact, it is a fact that in societies which are more equal, there is less violence against women. So we need to look at broader um, social and structural inequalities that keep women 
in that less powerful position, particularly in cycles of poverty, which I hope we talk about in a bit, but dismantling that greater structural inequality is going to be absolutely key to breaking these cycles. I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Deborah, and we'll definitely come back to some of those issues. Um, Schaefer, I think you're still with us. I'm going to go back and just pick up, I know you've done a lot of work with different international institutions, with civil society, with the United Nations, and Shakria touched on the role of the United Nations. What do you think could be done differently in the way the international institutions work with, with civil society activists and governments from what you've seen? I think, I think there are a couple of things that um, all of these institutions put together, be they government, be they civil society, be they even private sector institutions or systems that they can do. I think one of them is tackling the culture of violence or the, the culture that enables violence because violence doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't just happen in one corner. There's a whole systemic culture that enables this violence and that culture is institutionalized, right? So then understanding the context within which this violence happens is one of the things that needs to happen. And what this means is that, for example, a government should be able to re-examine within itself what are the culture, what is the culture that it is you know, it is kind of um, rooting or it's kind of anchoring within the broader society. Is it a government that is one, um, targeting um, targeting the fact that we have a lot of predators within the, within the state? And then what is it doing legally? What is it doing legislatively? What is it doing in terms of implementation? What is it doing, for example, with police reforms? You know, is reporting abuse as an, an easy thing for women or an easy thing for anybody who's abused, you know, sexually or otherwise? If it's yes, then it means that they're, they're starting to do something. If it's no, then it means the government needs to start reevaluating what are some police reforms that needs to happen so that women feel safer in the hands of police. Because something that we see often is whenever a woman is, is abused, she gets double marginalized or she gets double violated. Because when you go to report, the police themselves start asking you, but are you sure you were really abused? Where are the scars of, of the abuser? All of these questions that are deeply unnecessary. It's also that um, governments can also start looking at legal reforms Forms. What does the justice system look like? Because we know justice system, uh, systems are operated by people who have biases and stereotypes against women or against women and girls. So then what does these reforms look like, right? Are they progressive? Uh, do they have a gender lens? Do they have uh, people who are implementing them from a place that exercises the rights of women, the safety of women? Because when women pursue justice or pursue legal uh, redress, they get more into danger. So what is this justice system looking like within countries? Within institutions, it's looking at what are the policies that run this particular institution, be they global, be they national, be they regional, right? What are the policies within these institutions? Are these institutions the one that uphold abusive culture or uphold abusive behavior, that uphold toxicities, that uphold stereotypes and biases against women? If there are, what needs to happen? You know, Who needs to be held accountable? How do we start seeking redress? If it is around looking at how we get action or we get um we get, we get tangible accountability. It is first looking at what are the processes that exist. So for example, a woman who is raped goes to a hospital and the doctor who's going to see her already has biases. Then we need to do an overhaul of, of you know, the, the medical system that kind of you know, takes care of women who've been violated, the young girls who've been violated, so that you don't have to prove again that yes, I was actually violated, that this is a thing that happened to me. While it is the doctors, the nurses are supposed to help you, then looking at how that exists within the broader society. Um, lastly, I think there's, there's the work of allies also within government and understanding that institutions, government, um, civil society, private sector, everybody who has power should wield power towards the people who don't have power. Right? And the people who currently don't have power, the people who are being abused the most, who are women? And these are marginalized women, these are women from minority groups, these are women who are poor, so who are not classed women, these are women who are, you know, uh, living with disabilities, these are women who didn't go to school and not educated, these are women who don't have access, these are women who don't probably speak even English, you know? So how do we wield power to these particular women so that they can be able to speak for themselves? When they speak for themselves, they are safe. When they speak, they are believed, because there's a whole campaign that's, you know, that's being run around believe women when women speak please hear them and believe their stories that they don't have to prove twice that they have been abused right so how do we break these cycles and i think the last thing is building on what uh, preet had mentioned which is how do we completely dismantle the stereotypes 
um, within which we start raising boys and girls differently. You know, we start telling the girl who's young, who doesn't know anything, you need to be careful, you need to wear this, you need to come home at this time, you, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Well, we are not teaching the same thing to men or like to young boys, you're not telling them you need to respect women, you need to not do this, you need to not say that, you cannot tell this to somebody else, right? How do we start overhauling how we're just raising young boys and girls within society and make that become something that it's, it's it's within the institutions, it's in, it's in um, the education system, it's within the workspaces, it's within marriages or relationships or partnerships. How does that happen? So those are a couple of things that I think could happen or should happen. Thank, thanks, Jay, for really important points. You know, the G7 under the French presidency did a whole thing around discriminatory laws and laws that empowered women. And to your point at the beginning, is the accountability really there to see what's really changed in every single country? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to go to Shakria as well to pick up on that point. Shakria, obviously, um, so many women and girls, as you said, are at risk right now in Afghanistan. What should the international community, what should governments like the UK be doing to help protect women and girls? Um, it is very essential to protect women's rights, and especially girls' rights. Of course, rights for the education is the most basic right, which is today it has been taken away from the girls and women in Afghanistan. So a, a few things needs to be happen. Number one, I think um, the, the UK government will make a coalition with the others, uh, United States and other countries, to keep and hold Taliban to be accountable, what is their action? At least a United Kingdom should enforce themselves to recognize Taliban because such a brutal barbaric um, regime shouldn't get international recognition unless they will not bring reform internally by action. And of course, unless they will be facing the lack of legitimacy enter inside of Afghanistan. So, but I think I also would like to raise one important issue. Today, Afghanistan is facing the humanitarian crisis and this is the right time to reach women through to the international organization with the help of local non-governmental organization, re, um, uh, how I could call, uh, uh, giving back job for those women, which is they lost their job through to the international and local non-governmental organization. That's how we can, move back and bring back women in the society. If as much as we eliminate women from government system and non-government system, that much it will pressurize women mentally and of course financially. They will be in a worse extreme situation. This is how I believe that not only United Kingdom but other countries also can do the same uh, thing. But what is the most important? I would like the Afghan woman voice to be loud please be loud and speak on hands behalf because a woman being, you understand how we are suffering and what is the pain we have. So that is with articles, talking with the government, with your political parties, uh, establishing women's forums. These are the kind of activity at least we can make. But what one thing is really lacking at the moment we are facing is the lack of solidarity among women women in politics, women in business sector, women in private sector. I think we need to build some sort of solidarity and unity among women for those great values, which is, we believe, equality. Thanks, Thanks very much, Shakri. It's really powerful. And, you know, as a borough in Southwark, we've got a lot of refugees here at the moment from Afghanistan, and we're doing what we can. And it's about helping people's voices to be heard because they're you're all people who've got powerful stories and know what needs to happen. Um, Pre, I think there's a, a good follow-on to you. Obviously, unfortunately, Labour is not in government at the moment, but what more could the Labour Party be doing to tackle violence against women and girls internationally? And are there areas that we can work with the current government on? Yeah, this is something that the shadow development team have been looking at. And of course, Yasmin has been leading on. We put out a call for um, consultation on a feminist international development policy. I think everything we do has got to have a gendered lens. So we've got to look at everything for what is the impact for women and girls in policies and programs, whether it's bilateral, whether it's multilateral. Um, and, and there are really, really good examples. I mean, I'll share a story, actually. Um, you know, my, my father in the 80s, 
when the, the, the term abuse didn't actually exist and there wasn't services for many women that were getting married to men that came from India, for example, in our community. The only place that they had was the local place of worship. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, he, he, he was of the view that actually these women needed support. So they would come into our local Gurdwara and they would share um, concerns with him and he would you know, thinking back on it now, it's not the way to do things, but him and the five men from the committee would turn up to this house and my father would take me along. I was only a teenager and say, you really need to speak to this woman and make sure that you can, uh, you know, take down her concerns and we might need to raise this. Um, and, and these five men would literally say to these women that, you know, uh, you know, if you treat this uh, woman like this, then we're going to shame you in front of all our community. And the thing is, cultural practices around the world do need male leaders actually to become strong allies for us. And so I think policies, when we think about um, FCDO and development policy, we've got to be working with faith leaders. We've got to understand where power, where influence actually takes place and who is able to shift some of this uh, thinking. Uh, and so if we don't include them, then we're never really going to address or break down those kind of cultural barriers, those stereotypes, the expectation of what women need to be doing. So. And as I said, we need to be supporting and funding those women rights organizations on the ground. Far too often they don't get the money, they don't get the support. And, you know, I think, you know, far too often our organizations are so bureaucratized that we are looking for similar organizations that can meet indicators and not deliver actually what we need to do. We need to come out of this mindset, especially from uh, an FCDO perspective as to, you know, who do we fund? It can't just be about people that have got big setups, big HR departments, big organizations. It's got to be the very people at the grassroots level who can actually, uh, you know, scale up projects if they work and we've got the evidence base to do that. So I think, you know, there's been some really good examples, for example, um, you know, domestic violence reportage increased by 21.7% in Indian cities because they had the presence of women's police stations. You know, many of the researchers actually found that having police officers at uh, these women's uh, police stations were less likely to impose harmful gender norms on survivors of abuse, for example. So in some places where culture is a really predominant factor uh, and this doesn't actually get uh, spoken on, it becomes a very much a personal affair and the state doesn't really want to get involved in those countries, initiatives like this do make a difference. Uh, we also saw in Colombia and Sweden, more women became eligible to receive financial assistance. Italy launched a campaign called Libera Poi, which means a free woman can. Uh, making sure that women feel that, uh, you know, uh, to ensure that women who feel they are under threat know that they can actually receive financial assistance to leave home. I think that is an absolutely, uh, I, I think that's really important. We see that here in, in, in the United Kingdom far too often. Many women just didn't leave because of the financial position that they found themselves. And actually men, you know, own the property or uh, they had very little, uh, you know, in their name. It's the same for women across the world. They don't own land rights. They don't have property to their name. It isn't easy to to escape, for example, in the same way as it is. Uh, so these financial assistance programs, I think, are really, really important. So, uh, you know, definitely under Labour, we would have a gendered lens. Uh, we would look at everything from a from a feminist uh, perspective. We would make sure that we are supporting the very grassroots uh, and not really, uh, you know, creating those barriers that many women uh, tell us constantly that they face. So thanks, Alice. Thank, thank you, Pri. And as people are saying, it's a very, it's a brilliant panel we've got. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to questions in the audience in a, in a minute. So do, if you want to put them in the chat or get your hands ready, that'd be great. Diva, I just want to pick up again, just on the, on the, the point around laws. And also there's a lot of conversation in the chat about police and institutions, just not either having trust in them or, you know, behaving right, which we've seen really tragically in the UK recently. From, from your perspective, what kind of needs to change specifically in the UK legal system to protect women? And are you optimistic that those changes will be made? Thanks, Alice. Um, so recently, just, just um, this month, there was the um, International um, Labour uh, Organisation Convention 190 Against Harassment and Violence in the Workplace, which was passed, which was very good news. Um, but the Istanbul, Istanbul Convention still um, is yet to be ratified. But um, to be honest, my, 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 my general thoughts on this is that legal reform is a very, very blunt tool for tackling um, violence against women. It um, obviously pays a part of it because, you know, you need that legal reform, but working on the front line and actually supporting women through the, the justice process, um, these 
you know, symbolics meaning has very little to people when we know that the rape prosecution and conviction rate in this country and in most countries is absolutely abysmal. Um, there is really very little incentive to go through these um, justice systems. And as you've already mentioned, um, many women don't trust these systems. Um, they have trust, you know, they have distrust against the state more generally. Um, what I would, you know, much, I think far too much discourse has been you know, in the Labour Party and without, you know, outside of the Labour Party, too much discourse is about how we can introduce new criminal justice offences and throw people into the, the criminal justice system. When I'm telling you in my experience on the front line, it is no deterrent to Borg because if it was, I wouldn't be so busy every day um, dealing with things that um our everyday experiences for women. And, and just to sort of contrast that as well, you know, people might be surprised to think, to realize that a country like Pakistan um, actually has sexual harassment, is, is illegal, domestic abuse is illegal. Um, they actually have quite, you know, quote unquote, progressive laws when it comes to um, tackling sexual uh, harassment in the workplace. You know, they have a time limit of, it's supposed to be 30 days that things are in, investigated. So on paper, that sounds great, but we know that the real issue is that people don't want to come forward because we have chronic, chronic underreporting when it comes to these crimes um, and a very, um, a very limited engagement when it comes to the criminal justice system and rightly so because when you see the rape convictions and things like that you think you might think you know why bother why put myself through this you know going to be this really traumatizing experience and unfortunately a lot of women most of the women I speak to who go through the criminal justice system um regret it wish they wish they'd never done it and at that point um it's just really too late. So uh, what I'd like to see in terms of legal reform um, is not so much addressing perpetrator behavior, but supporting survivors, you know, getting redress to survivors to help them, you know, like I mentioned before, help them break that cycle of poverty, which sometimes keeps them in abusive situations. So for example, if we look at something like immigration status abuse, which happens, you know, a lot to migrant women, uh, black and minoritized women, um, the, the Domestic Abuse Act, which was passed recently, meant that um, if somebody was identified, you know, it means that if somebody's uh, identified at, at being at risk of domestic abuse, the you know local councils now have an obligation to house these people and kind of break them away from, um, you know, help them break away from their perpetrator, which means they actually have an opportunity to live a life free from the perpetrator's abuse. Um, so that's the kind of legal reform I would kind of advocate, sort of uh, looking at direct address for survivors. So for example, we don't, um, there is no guarantee that you're going to have access to legal aid in this country if you are a victim of sexual violence. Um, just like victims of domestic abuse, they have to go to extraordinary lengths to prove that they've been a victim of abuse. Um, if you are a victim of sexual violence here, um, it's very much, uh, it's really, really difficult to even be able to fund your case. So I think that is a really huge problem because people don't actually have access to these laws. And even though they are the most vulnerable people and should be in recipient of things like legal aid, they actually find it the most difficult to access those things. Um, so yeah, I think it's not, it's not about just introducing new laws as well. It's about reforming um, the current institutions that we have. So, for example, I think, you know, I would advocate for, you know, serious reform of the CPS and the police to address um, the quite clear, quite clear institutionalized misogyny and sexism within those institutions, which, let's face it, were built by men for men and, and are not usually a place where women can access justice or safety from from Vogue. Thanks. Thanks so much, Steve. Some really, also really good practical suggestions there as well. Um, I'm going to go to questions. I, I'm hoping, I think Schaefer is still there. She may need to go. And I also just want to make a point that, you know, Schaefer actually in Kenya set up a political party in the face of, in a country that is incredibly difficult. I think sometimes she describes herself as a recovering politician. And we've got lots of politicians here and lots of councillors on the call as well, I can see, and former MPs and current MPs. And, you know, I think a lot of women in politics, we need more women in politics uh, as well, who also face a huge amount of, of violence of different uh, sorts. So 
shout out to everyone and as everyone says great great presenters um if you could raise your virtual hand that would be great uh let me just go to the gallery um i can see one hand up i'll take them in groups of three so i've got brampre first if you can if you want to say where you're from great um uh, and keep your questions relatively short so you've got more time that'd be great so we've got brampre and then chantelle brampre Hi, my name is Bram. I'm from Leicester. Um, my question is to um, the panel. We were speaking about solidarity and building solidarity across borders, um, but I believe it's really difficult for women to do so with access as well. So there's limited access. Women have all types of different access to technology if we're talking about building solidarity over social media. So how do we overcome challenges such as access um, across these borders if we're going to be building um, a movement and, and building solidarity internationally? Thanks, great, great question. I'll go to Chantelle and then Kat, I can see he's got a hand up as well, Chantelle. Thank you. Um, yes, I think there's, a, there's an awful lot of issues in here and everything is that's being said is absolutely brilliant. The research is absolutely amazing. There's absolutely tons of it out there. The problem is the implementation of what's been put in the research and what has been said in the research. And that has been reflected in what has been said today. And I think speaking about the um, the UK, in the UK, it, we need to start looking at at where the problem is. The problem is in the community. And so we need to go to the community to deal with it at its base. And its base is dealing with the young kids and stuff that are growing up now. Because the misogyny is absolutely spot on. That needs to be to be sorted right down at that very, very beginning. And we need to get in there. And the money that's been put into support through um, the various community um, access points it's been cut back and cut back and cut back until we've got um, like family support groups and things within the community are not there and that needs to be put back. Also, there's things that need to be changed in the law, like Claire's law is a brilliant one. Claire's law says that we've got to have access. The police should say if somebody, if you've got a partner and you're concerned about it, you can go to the police and the police will say, yes, this person's got a history of violence against women and girls and it's there it's out in the open and uh, there's 101 things but we need to do it it's all right talking about it and the rest of it but we need to put money into it and we need to invest in putting services in there to support women and girls within the community and to change the community's um opinions on this the way they look at it the misogyny and all the rest of it i'm transgender we also get transgender misogyny as well which um is even better but more fun but there you go um my that's my bit <laughs> so local implementation brilliant points uh cat i'll go to you and i'll come back to the panel oh thank you thanks i'm cat i'm one of the councillors down in the southeast i just wanted to ask the panel about your thoughts about um teaching and trying to break down the patriarchy in primary schools and in secondary schools um, because it's really interesting I have a boy I have a girl but I see so early on the patriarchy being embedded um, in and actually it really started um, in year four for my daughter and um, so I think a lot of this we need um, education with the boys and the girls and how they push back on it as well in our schools and I just wonder what your thoughts are on that thank you thank you very much Kat um, I'm gonna go maybe first to, to Shakria and then and then to Shafer. Shakria did you want to pick up maybe sp particularly on that solidarity across borders like how can we build that and then any other points from those questions that you wanted to pick up on I think solidarity across borders this is very necessary through to the social media, through to the media, we can build that solidarity. When I say be our voice, that means solidarity, understanding. I believe women, despite of where we live, what is our religion, what is our skin color, we are facing the same type of violence. We are living in the globe, which is nothing will make us from our feeling to understanding. We are almost the same. What we are facing it's the same the form of violence is also the same is not different that is the reason why we need to be united among each other and this is i think true to the social media we can build up true to the group we can build up so it's it's not something that we are asking start from the sky i think in this 21st century this is happening but let me say one thing according to my own experience it's not about the solidarity 
education is very important. We need to make men to be educated, how to, how to behave women from the very early age till very top. So from top to bottom, both. It doesn't matter if they are grown up, they will understand. No, they need to educate. We need to educate them um, all, all the time. We have to remind them how to behave. The second important thing, laws are important, but the implementation of law is more important. So law enforcement needs to be well equipped, well educated how to behave women. And the third, the most important advocacy. If I don't know what is my rights, law, education cannot help me. So this is important to work in these three different layers for the purpose to eliminate this masculine or male violence from the society. Otherwise, if we let things, it will go may more far beyond. We are in 21st century, but we are facing those type of violence, which is, was on 18th century. We have to wake up. We have to shake up the word in our mentality. We need to think different than before. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Totally agree. Schaefer, I'll go to you. And I know the Women Political Leaders Organization works to build solidarity as well. I don't know if you want to pick up on that or any other points within the, the conversation. Absolutely. No, absolutely. You're very right. Um, because one of the three things that we are doing um, is, is building communities around women, because we, we understand as an organization that um, women women's leadership journeys is very solitary. It's a lonely it's a lonely journey and it's also a very dangerous journey because a woman who is already visible is a woman who's is seen or perceived as opening up herself to be attacked. And we see this on social media and even otherwise where a woman who is either a leader of a particular organization, a country, an institution is much more trolled or is much more prone to receiving violent attacks um, than their male counterparts. So yes, um, um, WPL works very, very vigorously in terms of building solidarity and communities around women. And the reasons why it does this is be able to decenter um, the already privileged voices. And what this means is when you're building solidarity, you have to understand that the people you want to build solidarity with exist within different contexts. So there are people in the front line, you have the activists, you have the feminists, you have the people who are doing the systemic change, you have the people who are holding on to, um, you know, holding on, holding on and bringing the intergenerational leadership um, um, connection together because there's such a huge rift as well between the people or like the women who are reading leadership and women who are not or aspiring to. So the people who are building and bridging the intergenerational leadership disconnect. So while you're building solidarity, it's important to be aware of all of these different ways or, or all of these different elements within which the women exist. So while you know this, it's important to understand that the context within which somebody either in Nairobi where I am and somebody in Nigeria, somebody in Morocco, somebody in um, Congo Brazzaville, somebody in Bali, all of these women might be experiencing one common problem, but in very, in very different ways. So understanding their context is important because you'll understand there's one woman who can talk vocally on social media, there's another woman who cannot. And the other woman who cannot probably doesn't have access. The other woman who doesn't speak is probably not speaking because of the environment or because of the society that she lives in, right? Because of the patriarchy, because of the insecurity that she faces. So understanding those are very important. So I think for people who are building solidarity, one of the things that we need to understand is how to complete the loop, you know, and completing the loop of change here is what we need to do, which means something like this, a conversation like this, where you'll find a lot more women whose voices are not heard here. We bring them on board, we link them to this particular conversation, not just giving them the platform, but also giving them the microphone, right? Because one of the things that we see is that a lot often the people who get to suffer from violence, the people who are marginalized are brought into to, into spaces and then they're not given the microphone. So other people speak on their behalfs and that's what I meant by decentralizing, I mean, decentering privileged voices because the people who have power must be able to seed power so that we can all be able to multiply and amplify power and eventually expand space so that the space doesn't just have uh, one person who is going to be targeted so that we can all fight as a community. So I wanted to mention that as regards building solidarity. Um, as regards patriarchy and education, it's systemic. I think there's a need for communities to start examining what the role of education is as regards raising baby, baby girls versus raising baby boys and that's treating them as children and not um, overtly imposing gender roles, not overtly imposing responsibilities um, that are biased upon one gender or, or the other. So those are my points for now. 
Thank you very much, Schaefer. Um, I'll go to Deba and, and then Pree, just to pick up on maybe the community investment point or en education. Um, Deba, over to you. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, just to, um, sorry, just to pick up on the education point and just your point you were making, Shreefa. Um, um, I don't actually think that education should just be targeted at misogyny and patriarchy. I think the patriarchy is it is underpinned by racism, transphobia, ableism, trans misogyny, like, like you mentioned, um, Chantel. Um, all of these things interact with each other and I think if we're going to be teaching it in schools we have to be teaching it through an intersectional lens and understanding how these multiple oppressions you know stack on top of each other and um, it's not just the patriarchy it's all of those things and I believe all of those oppressions you know kind of you know work in a pyramid kind of downwards um, downwards in terms of you know keeping marginalized and minoritized people um, that's what underpins the patriarchy, right? You know, some people have the power, some people don't. Um, so I think when we talk about education, I think obviously it should be vital, you know, it's vitally important and it should be mandatory. But I think we need to push the conversation a bit further on and sort of advocate for intersectional in education as well. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there, I think. Thanks, I'm and Pri, I'll go to you and then we'll have one quick round of questions and then we'll wrap up. Great. Uh, yeah, just um, quickly touching up on the kind of Claire's law and the local stuff. I think one of my really big concerns is, is that for a lot of women, they just don't know where to go to access support. And so we are seeing CABs being closed, law societies funding being reduced, women's aid funding cut back. And so actually the support services are making sure they're in the right language as well are not really available for women. So women feel quite stuck and end up staying in their situations because there is nowhere else to go. And so, they, you know, they are really, really afraid. I mean, I have it in my surgery where women come and they're absolutely petrified when they're sharing the information with you. They don't know what's gonna to happen to that information. Will somebody tell their partners? I, I've, I've heard stories of women saying that they've, you know, taken out all the appropriate course of action of legal, aid, of legal action, got a solicitor, gone to seek a non mal order, for example. And actually through the court process, uh, their address was divulged to to the perpetrator and so you know it, it is really it, it's really difficult um you know when you actually think about well where are the places women will go to who are the people it's elected members we've got to make sure that we have access to information we know how to signpost people we know what's actually available and we understand the importance of actually uh, you know, the, the, the keeping that information private and confidential, speaking to our staff, making sure they have the appropriate training in terms of actually how they share that information, doing it in a very, very sensitive uh, manner as well. In terms of the ed education, I mean, gosh, where do you start really? Because this is a massive piece of work. I mean, it needs an overhaul of how we teach education anyway. How do we get young people to think about who they are and why it is that they have that view of themselves? And I think you can't do this without actually including parents and, and uh, addressing some of the cultural norms, because of course you have to get them on side. You need their consent in terms of how you address this um, issue and I think you know it's not just about what happens in primary it's throughout our education but what happens at secondary what happens when you go to college what happens when you go to university I mean it's seeing it through uh, and trying to support initiatives you know I, I, I'm very lucky I've got the University of Birmingham I've got a very active students union guild we recently had an event around uh, spiking uh, you know and, and, and safety of women and there's lots of things that we can do locally and it's about bringing partners together finding you know what are those safe routes that women can walk home to their student accommodation how many cameras are on that route you know what are we doing as a city when we are you know planning various things in terms of making sure that we have women and girls at the heart of some of our policies and thinking through actually uh, the impact that it has on them so I think in terms of education I mean it is huge you know I am seeing far too often uh, from secondary schools sexual harassment and assaults of girls I mean, it's becoming so norm across many of our um, secondary schools and it's just not acceptable. I mean, the, 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 there was a program recently that I was watching. I mean, I learned so much about actually what's going on for young people, but it really is a really, really difficult time for many of our young people, especially with access to social media, um, the kind of pressure that they are put under. You know, girls do need a lot of 
uh, almost support within schools, that safe space to talk about some of this stuff. Where, where are those safe spaces actually uh, for young girls to come out and talk about the, the normalization of what boys expect, you know, asking them to send various pictures, for example. You know, why do girls feel that they don't have another, they don't have a choice? It's about education, it's about confidence, it's about the ability for us to have these conversations uh, in a way that enables them to do that. So yeah, a lot to unpack on the education bit, but thanks. Alice. Thanks so much, Bree. I know we're coming to the end. I'm just going to go and see one hand up, which is Margaret Williams, and then there's a couple in the chat, and then I'll go back to the panel, but also ask you just to make your concluding remarks in responding to any final points. So I'm just going to take the one hand that I, could, I saw first, which was Margaret uh, Williams. Oh. Hi, yeah, I'm Maggie Williams. Um, I, I work in the broad sector and have done for quite a great number of years. Um, and talking about uh, issues with the with the legal system, we, we, we've all spoken about, we know about the issues that are currently going on in the legal system is failing women, um, but also um, within the family courts, there are failures within the family courts in terms of child contact and residency, where women's abuse is being minimised or dismissed altogether. Um, so when we're talking about things like access to justice and access to fairness in the courts, these things are going on now. Um, and then in terms of, of housing, women who Margaret, I'm home... really just, we've only got 60 seconds left is yeah. it right okay into women women who are in temporary accommodation are there for weeks months or even years uh and women subject to immigration controls uh and my point is how how you know this this all colludes with abusers and uh, affects how people view survivors and my 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 point is how do we how do we overcome those issues and support survivors at the same time in that circumstance when when the structures actually are not supportive towards survivors thank thanks very much Meg. i'm just going to pick a couple of points from the chat just one question from fatima how do you address this issue with women and ethnic minorities where women don't feel comfortable or sometimes feel stifled or ashamed to come forward what are the support mechanisms there um and tim who's joined us asked you know and maybe labor women's network wants to pick on this up at the end what can male allies do to help the labor women's network and just generally how can uh, men in the party help to get um men to speak out more in solidarity and then some specific points about Keir's law as well so i think if you want to just 30 seconds to each speaker would be brilliant. I'm going to just hand over to my colleague Yasmin at the end to wrap us up. But if I go in reverse order, so Preet, then um, Debo, then Shukriya. So Preet, over to you for a few final remarks. My, my final remarks really is that we've got to show that sense of solidarity. We've got to amplify voices. You know, it doesn't matter that people are sitting across the global south. Actually, with hashtags, with social medias, we can be very, very creative. We can have activist networks sharing good practice. We need the solutions. What works? We need to be giving and empowering people with the tools that actually will make the difference that we already know that, you know, are, are having an impact. So just thank you so much keep doing what you're doing because I know a lot of you are involved in this area and it's a hugely uh, huge amount of respect to all of you. Thanks. Uh, Deba, over to you. Hi, yeah. Um, look, what I would just emphasise today is is looking at structural inequality and, and how we can dismantle that. I think that is the key that is going to unlock how we solve um, VORG, how we actually tackle it. Um, and I think that starts by understanding it through an intersectional lens and how we are, you know, like like the comments in, in the chat say that, you know, obviously this depends on different cultures and different privileges, and that will affect the way that you are more you know, vulnerable to harassment and, and violence, but also how you interact with these systems that are supposed to support you. Like Maggie said, you know, the family court system, the justice system, it's not an equal system for everyone who's interacting with those systems. Um, so I think that's really the key to unlocking Borg. And once we do that, I think we might have a hope, um, a chance of making things better. Thanks so much, Deba. And Shakriya, over to you. I believe culture barrier is using as an excuse to increase the violence against women. For me, 60 days of activism is not make sense. The problem we are facing every day, we need to speak out about it every single day. And I hope we will be witness of one day, the elimination of violence, a dream become true as a top policy for every government and for the activism. 
Thank you so much, Shakria. I mean, thank you. I think everyone said it in the chat, but what an amazing panel. It's been really inspiring. I've learned a huge amount. Um, can we just do a virtual thank you to our, our brilliant uh, panel? Thank you so much for giving us the time. Um, thank you, Labour Women's Network, for co-hosting with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm just going to hand over to um, Yasmin from the Labour Foreign Policy Group. And I can see Paymana and Jess are on as well from our exec committee. And thank you particularly, uh, Paymana, who, who asked Shakria to join us, which, is, which was brilliant. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Yasmin to wrap us up. Um, and yeah, say thank you. Really? Yasmin, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Alice. I, I just want to uh, hi, just want to say again, a huge thank you for the uh, for the panelists. Uh, I'm Yasmin from the Labour uh, Foreign Policy Group, and that was the first time, uh, but I hope not the last time, we had a, a, an event on gender and foreign policy. And then it was really interesting from the panel, from uh, from all of you, to to hear that we need to greater a greater push when it comes to access to justice across the from you know from when it comes to gender based violence and what's very important from this session to uh, to know that women rights are human rights and it's not just a battle for uh, uh, for women but as well we need we strongly need men as well to join the battle to uh, overcome this uh, this issue across the world um I thank you again, and I will, we will again, the, lab, the Labour Foreign Policy Group, we run, hope, more session on gender and foreign policy. So please stay tuned. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye.